What up, what up, what up? I have an incredible video for you today. We are going to be going through more FTX drama, the BlockFi bankruptcy details, Robinhood suing Sam Bankman fraud, Jack Dorsey suing Bitcoin.com. Basically, it's gonna get juicy. It's gonna get hot up in here, okay? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh man, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Did you? Okay, let's get back to some crypto. Just and don't forget to watch those last couple videos about this whole Sam Bankman freed FTX situation. I actually made a playlist on my channel that has 13 videos. Just go watch the last two. Watch the one that says 1.4 trillion lost in the crypto bear market. And then the last one that I just made, the blue uh, thumbnail with me on it. Okay, so check out those two videos and this will be the third installment on that that good good okay now, don't forget you can click that video on the top right of the screen and you can click that little cogwheel and go to advanced settings i film in 6k i scale to 4k so you can just hit advanced settings and go all the way up and boom clean and smooth and for you guys in the ear pods you guys on the sound system guess what you got that dynamic surround sound who loves you, baby? So yeah, it's gonna be a good one, and I guess it's about that time. Yup, that's right. Welcome to the wheelhouse. Now look, we're gonna go through the crypto market cap, we're gonna go through the prices, we're gonna go through the crypto bubbles, we're gonna go through all of it, and we're gonna go down this journey together, okay? But before we do, do me a little favor, show me a little love, right below the video, hit that like button, watch to the end, make a comment. Guys, we have a Discord, you can come in, the link is in the description. Let's get started. All right, let's see what's Papa locking over here with the cryptocurrency prices and market cap. So, the global crypto market cap is at 824.68 billy, okay? We got Bitcoin at 16,270. It's still in that range from 16,2 to 16,7. Ethereum's hovering at that 1182. BNB 296. Ripple almost 39 cents. Doge just over 10 cents. Cardano right about 31. Matic 83. Polkadot $5.16. Litecoin 75.38. Solana back down to 1344. Let's look at the bubs, those crypto bub bubs. Okay, all right. I see what you're doing here. You're basically teasing, giving us a little tease here. Doge up 35.6. What? HT 29.6. Curve 28. Ape 26.9. BNB 15.7. Litecoin 23. Man, moving and shaking for sure. Uh, but still way down low. Let's take a look at some of the news going on out there. We have been expecting a filing and reporting now for at least a week here that this would be expected at some point. And now we have some details. And what do we have from them? We have not just the plan to file for bankruptcy in New Jersey. We have some details about the scope of how big this bankruptcy proceeding is going to be. So $1 billion to $10 billion in assets is the general size. But more than 100,000 creditors, we would have to keep an eye on future filings to see how many that will ultimately be. Remember, FTX also had checked that last box on their filing. And it found out later that was about a million people at play here that we we're talking about. We also know that the concentration is different among the unsecured creditor group. So what is that exactly? It's more than 700 million that is really highlighted here, earmarked to the trustee of different depositors, FTX itself, which we'll talk a little more about, I know. And then also you have the SEC. So there are a lot of names that you don't have here, similar to FTX, but you know that those amounts are kind of isolated here between 1 million and $30 million. So you might see more contagion there among the people that they're owed money to because you don't know what they'll get back yet. But we know that that is the general size of a per, per customer, per creditor here that is owed money and how much generally they're owed. There's a question of chronology and timeline because it's clear BlockFi had issues before FTX's collapse, but at the same time, 
FTX's collapse seems to have made things worse for BlockFi. Um, if you follow that, Shanali, what is the relationship now between the two? The claim here on the bankruptcy filing is about $275 million for FTX earmarked. There's some really interesting unanswered questions here, Ed. If you look at the testimony by uh, an advisor here, you had seen that they didn't get money. They didn't get all the money that they had asked for from FTX to begin with, according to the Block 5 filings. Now remember, to your point, some of these issues started before FTX. That's why FTX got involved in the first place. They were related to Three Arrows. In FTX's filing, I would also point out that apparently the U.S. business of FTX lent money to BlockFi in part through that FTT token. And so my question here is this entire agreement, who owes who what and who is responsible for actually paying each other back after the Three Arrows debacle, I think is interesting. Now, remember, BlockFi has also said that getting money back from FTX might take time given FTX's own bankruptcy. So things are certainly complicated between the two. Shanali, over the weekend, it looked as though much of crypto Twitter had decided to up sticks and leave to the Bahamas at some point and do their own digging in some way, shape or form. That is because of the different jurisdictions with which FTX has been enveloped. Same thing here with BlockFi a bit. Obviously, Chapter 11 is, in a, is a protection here in the US, but it wasn't just based in the US. I spent an inordinate amount of time with bankruptcy lawyers <laughs> today for that reason, because it, to that end, they the had... the only people that win, Shanali. Truly. In this case, I will tell you just how much in a moment. But for BlockFi, they filed a petition with the... Muta and Supreme Court here so that they would have provisional liquidators in both regions now. Remember, from Bahamas point of view for FTX, there is a lot of dispute that has occurred since the bankruptcy proceedings have begun. And to the point that you even have the attorney general saying that some of the words that have come from the new FTX CEO are regrettable. So to the extent that the Bermuda government and the US stay in line in this bankruptcy filing, again, they want to recoup money for their customers, for their own people. And at the end of the day, what it seems like from the statements we're seeing from the Bahamas is also a redefine the credibility of every single jurisdiction's financial system and ability to embrace crypto still, yeah. but have tight rules around the industry such that people don't lose their funds. Wow. It's a lot to get your head around, right? You got BlockFi, Voyager, Celsius, Three Arrows, FTX, and hundreds of companies in multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions, multiple bankruptcy filings and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of customers. You have regulation, you have Congress hearings, senators rabble rousing, throwing their arms in the air for faster, tighter framework and regulation. It's just at that point where the dust has not settled. More information is constantly and consistently coming out. That's why I ask you to subscribe. Stay in touch with the channel. I will keep you abreast of everything. I will work all day, all night, researching this stuff, filming it, and putting it together for you. After we go through some of the crypto news that I told you at the beginning of the video, we're going to find out who Sam Bankman Fried is and how he became the youngest billionaire at the age of 29 years old. And then how he crushed the crypto market in 2022. And this is a developing story. This segment that I was gonna put in after was for an entirely different video. It's very, very good. Watch till the end. But first, I want to go through some of the current news and then we'll go ahead and get that edit in for you, okay? So like you just heard Shanali say, BlockFi files for bankruptcy, cites FTX collapse for its troubles. The crypto lender was previously rescued by FTX following Terra's stablecoin collapse. BlockFi announced on November 28th, that it had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The filing in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the District of New Jersey pertains to the company and its eight subsidiaries. The move comes after several days of speculation on the company's financial health after the collapse of FTX. Well, of course, do you blame them? BlockFi sues FTX Bankman Freed over shares in Robinhood. 
BlockFi is demanding Bankman Freed's investment company turn over its shares in Robinhood as collateral it agreed to pay as part of a pledge agreement. And Jack Dorsey of Square, now named Block, and previous CEO of Twitter, says they are suing Bitcoin.com for trademark infringement. The use of the designation Verse constitutes an infringement of our client's trademark under German trademark law, Block's legal counsel said in a letter to Bitcoin.com. Digital payments company Block is pursuing legal action against Roger Ver's Bitcoin.com over alleged trademark infringement involving its newly launched Verse token, which concluded a 33.6 million private sale in May 2022. And here we can see Kraken settles with U.S. Treasury's OFAC for apparent sanctions violations. The U.S.-based crypto exchange agreed to pay more than $362,000 as part of a deal to settle its potential civil liability related to violating sanctions against Iran. And we have some new Bitcoin miner capitulation. Bitcoin miners face a shakeout, one metric warns, as the November monthly close looms for Bitcoin. In a time of what analyst Willy Wu has called unprecedented deleveraging, Bitcoin is far from out of the woods after losing over 20% this month alone. The impact of the FTX implosion remains unknown, and warning signs continue to flow in even after the first wave of crypto business bankruptcies. In particular this week, eyes are on miners who are seeing profits squeezed by following spot prices and surging hash rates. Upheaval is in the air, and should another capitulation among miners occur, the entire ecosystem could be in for a further shock. Ah, so here we go. The rabbit hole is getting deeper. FTX reportedly used Alameda's bank accounts to process customer funds. Former FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried in a conversation with Vox admitting to using Alameda's banking facilities for FTX user deposits. Now, I went over that and showed all of the text messages from Sam Bankman-Fried and the reporter at Vox in a previous video. Uh, there are 13 videos already, this being the 14th, in a playlist on my channel. The last three, including this one, are outstanding on the series and developing story of the FTX collapse. And of course, calls for regulation get louder and louder as FTX contagion continues to spread. The FTX saga has made some crypto executives, researchers, analysts, and politicians more aligned on regulation than ever before. Link's price could rally on speculations over Chainlink's Oracle services growth coupled with a supportive technical pattern. Now, as a side note, I have an entire video dedicated to Chainlink coming out soon, but so make sure that you have the select all button on so that you're getting notified. Now, Silvergate denies recent FUD confirms minimal exposure to BlockFi. Silvergate Capital has been quick to distance itself from the now bankrupt crypto lender BlockFi. Guys, I know there's an article that says that they have minimal exposure. Just keep an eye. Silvergate's another big one. If they're having problems, it's going to show up soon. And compound finance to impose lending caps in light of failed Aave exploit. Some illiquid altcoins will have their borrow limit reduced by upward of 99%. And I went over this in just one of the last couple videos that I put out. But non-whale Bitcoin investors break new Bitcoin accumulation record. Bitcoin addresses holding up to 10 Bitcoin have been accumulating record amounts of Bitcoin in the aftermath of the FTX collapse. Yeah, guys, so we have a lot of news, a lot of questions. Not enough answers, although we are getting answers for some of them day by day. So make sure you hit the subscribe, you select all, you get the content every time I put a video out. And now let's listen to the story, how Sam Bankman fraud, one of the youngest billionaires at the age of 29, built his business 
became who he was and managed to unethically distribute user funds and collapse a crypto market in 2022. I don't think I give a shit about my legacy. That's not what matters. In the end, it, it's the mark that we actually leave on the world, not the mark we're perceived to leave on the world that matters. In an industry known for speed and scalability, it seems fitting one of the world's largest cryptocurrency exchanges imploded within days. The rise and fall of FTX revealed holes in the crypto space that industry peers, the media, and government officials either chose to overlook or refused to question. Beneath the promise of a decentralized financial future for the world stood a fragile ecosystem pioneered by young, ambitious founders determined to move mountains under the guise of effective altruism, a trendy philanthropy movement among tech founders. FTX's fallout wasn't the only concerning news out of the crypto industry in 2022. It follows the decimation of Lunacoin and the Voyager scandal, which leaves us wondering, can the public and government legislators trust the crypto system? Back in 2017, the crypto world was riding a pretty chaotic wave at, at that time. That was during what was known as, as the ICO boom or initial coin offering, where if you had an idea for a blockchain project, you wouldn't necessarily go to Silicon Valley venture capitalists on, uh, on Sand Hill Road. Um, you could actually just put out a white paper, um, create a wallet, sell tokens to investors, and people were able to raise tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars in a very quick amount of time. However, in, in 2018, um, the crypto market subsequently crashed. Bitcoin fell to under $4,000. There was a real fear that um, the market was going to completely bottom out. I remember some crypto um, folks just continuing to buy because um, either they felt that they were gonna go down with the ship or if Bitcoin and crypto recovered, they were getting the deal of the century. What really turbocharged all of this was the pandemic and, and more particularly the response from the US Federal Reserve and central bank and, and central banks around the world that injected trillions of dollars in liquidity into the global economy to help people make ends meet until August of 2020 when Michael Saylor, the ex-CEO of MicroStrategy, made a $250 million purchase of Bitcoin for his company's balance sheet, making it the primary treasury reserve asset it turned out to be the beginning of what was a major influx in institutional capital into Bitcoin. That led to a tsunami of, of interest, not just because, okay, look, here are these big publicly traded companies that are, are interested in the asset, but by this point, everybody was flush with cash. It was around this time that crypto latecomer Sam Bankman fried started to make headlines. He launched a quantitative trading firm called Alameda Research and found a way to exploit price differences in Bitcoin in different parts of the world uh, to make a sizable fortune. In particular, he bought them cheaply in the United States and was able to sell them in Japan for up to 30% more. Uh, he did that for, for a couple of years and then he ended up rolling some of those profits as well as taking on some new investors to create his exchange FTX. One of his investors was Chang Peng Zhao, the, uh, the founder and CEO of Binance, which is the largest crypto exchange in the world. FTX focused on a particular type of trade called derivatives, which are used as a hedging tool to help traders and people manage risk. FTX stands for Futures Exchange, and it was built specifically to handle those types of trades. FTX was a pretty good product. People liked it. It was advertised as uh, by traders for traders, and institutions trusted it. They, at some point, actually had a lot of money. Although looking at the balance sheet that came up, looks like a lot, large portion of it was um, coins that they themselves effectively created. Those coins created by FTX, which ultimately contributed to the company's downfall, were known as FTT. FTT belongs to this weird class of cryptocurrencies that are created by exchanges. And you can think of them as loyalty points because they give users all these perks on exchanges like um, discounts and trades. FTT is kind of a utility token. It doesn't represent an ownership stake in FTX. But in a certain way, it is similar to a stock because it is associated with a company. When FTT tokens first hit the market, they were performing well. 
FTX itself was established in this weird time in 2019 when kind of the big bear market almost ended and FTX wasn't hasn't really experienced any of the big drawdowns that other exchanges saw before it was a latecomer so FTT was also just going up I think um, it was worth over $20 at some point it appears that FTX and Alameda were using FTT the token token that FTX created as one of the largest assets in their balance sheets and were allegedly loaning money against it. There's lots of questions about the intrinsic value of Bitcoin, Ethereum, other tokens out there. Um, many people that don't follow the industry closely will say, just a bunch of digits on a piece of paper, what's backing it? The question about intrinsic value for tokens like FTT and, and BNB and, and CRO and so on and so forth is even murkier. Essentially, the intrinsic value is just based on different types of benefits and privileges that you get for using an exchange, like trading discounts or increased um, rewards for if you lend your tokens on the platform. The problem, though, is that a lot of these tokens trade on exchanges around the world, and people buy them as a proxy for owning stock in those companies. Many people bought FTT because they kind of felt that directionally it was going to be closely correlated with the fortunes of, of FTX. FTT had the trust of traders and investors alike, and buy-in for the token was making Sam Bakeman fried and others incredibly wealthy. Our cover story was, was really the first big profile of Sam Bankman fried in a magazine and, and really looked at sort of his, his background and how in a very rapid period of time, he became the richest 29-year-old in the world. At the time that we did the story, I think we had him valued at $22.5 billion, although a lot of it was, was illiquid locked up in, in FTT tokens that played a role in the downfall of all this and FTX equity. A lot of people are asking why did nobody realize this sooner? I will say that there were certain warning signs there. I mean, for one, the ties between FTX and Alameda were largely known. The first time we even looked at Sam Bankman-Fried's wealth, he, he shared a, a, a spreadsheet with us breaking down his token holdings and, and the various assets that he had. It was in pretty like non-traditional and somewhat illiquid tokens. FTX appeared to be a very profitable company. FTX only has about 300 employees. Payroll is typically the highest expense that an exchange has. The overhead is basically a software company. The overhead's very, 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 very low. So all of those things combined, plus the fact that subsequently he started raising money at massive valuations all the way up to $32 billion from some of the most esteemed investors in, in the world, the, the Sequoias, the, the SoftBanks, the, the, the Tiger Globals, etc. For all intents and purposes, he was a multi-billionaire. Events in question were happening at the time of Forbes' cover story. It's possible that they were hidden by the bull market. But on November 2nd, 2022, FTX's facade was shattered in a matter of hours. Alameda Research, FTX's sister quantitative trading firm, had large holdings of FTT, which it used as leverage to make risky, speculative bets on other cryptocurrencies and complex financial products. It also became clear that Sam Bakeman fried might be using customer funds through FTX to help keep Alameda Research afloat. As long as the price of FTT remained stable without a rush of FTX customer withdrawals, the whole operation could appear solid. Coindesk published a, a copy of Alameda's balance sheet, which showed that a lot of its assets were in FTT, which is kind of an exchange token used to get discounts and stuff on FTX that is pretty illiquid. And when that happened, that caused a lot of people to get, to get scared. The real catalyst for all of this is when, um, shortly after Coindesk published that article, Chang Peng Zhao, CZ, announced that he was going to sell about $500 million of FTT on the open market. This automatically um, created a lot of fear and doubt among FTT holders. After CZ decided to offload his exchange's FTT holdings, investors pulled out en masse, which tanked FTT's worth and Sam Bakeman Free's operation. In 24 hours, the coin went from around $22 to under $5, wiping out more than $2 billion in value. Ultimately, what happened was uh, Sam Beckman fried reached out to, to CZ, his earliest investor, to see if, see if Binance would be interested in acquiring FTX. Binance and FTX signed a 
a letter of intent, but it was non-binding. About 24 hours after that letter was signed, CZ and Binance announced that they were going to walk away from the deal, that there were too many problems at FTX. And then eventually the company decided to, to file for bankruptcy, chap Chapter 11, Bankman Freed, uh, stepped down as, as CEO. And, and now once again, the industry's trying to deal with the fallout of that. And now we're also trying to understand the subsequent collateral damage that's coming from, from this bankruptcy. Because Three Arrows Capital was seen as sort of at the hub of major trading desks and, and firms around the world. Uh, FTX was orders of magnitude. Bigger. So how did no one realize earlier that the math behind FTT was suspicious? There is a lot of finger pointing here. Who was responsible? The media, the investors, the politicians. Media definitely has a responsibility. We do. What was, I think, very interesting about Sam is that compared to other crypto billionaires, he was very friendly, talkative, open. He was always somewhere giving speeches, giving interviews. He was easily accessible any time of day and night. He gave information that no other crypto billionaire or executive of his scale gave, which in hindsight is also a red flag. Gary Gensler, who is the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US, is also in an awkward position. This is the chief financial cop. FTX was getting away with what it was doing right under his nose. Gary Gensler has taken a very a uh, forceful stance on crypto since uh, entering his position uh, w under the Biden administration. He's made it a priority to uh, you know, crack down on fraudulent coin offerings. Just last month, he had a very high publicity charge of Kim Kardashian over promoting the Ethereum Max coin. It seems that uh, you know some of these smaller fish were distracting his attention from the big fish, which of course was FTX. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty because technically FTX International was based in the Bahamas. There was also FTX US, which was based in the US. A couple years ago, um, the Bahamas passed a digital assets focused legislation that led exchanges like FTX to domicile in the islands. It wouldn't be right to say that FTX wasn't regulated. It was, it was regulated by the Bahamian authorities. But I think the questions that everyone will be asking now is, well, what kind of oversight they had. Now there are reports that some employees or people who worked with Sam on other projects tried to raise those issues, but they were quickly shut down because of the influence that he commanded, because the industry is so small. There is a discussion about making it a requirement for exchanges to come up with proof of reserves, which is basically a way to prove cryptographically that centralized entity has enough assets against the liabilities. CZ, the CEO of Binance, the company at the center of this whole thing, came out and said, I haven't been too vocal about issues that I saw, but maybe I should start doing it. Many people took it at face value that there was enough of a separation of duties between FTX and, and Alameda or, or Gap that no major conflicts of interest would, would actually arise. Obviously, that does not necessarily seem to be the case. It, the, the biggest trigger for, for what happened, and, and this is all still being reported out, so no one really knows for sure exactly what happened, but it appears that the Alameda was a victim of the fallout that stemmed from earlier volatility this year when the Terra USD and Luna ecosystem, $55 billion um, for essentially a stable coin, um, completely got wiped out. That led also to the fall of Three Arrows Capital, a multi-billion dollar hedge fund based out in Singapore, bankruptcies of a crypto broker, Voyager, that traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and a, a lender called Celsius. People always wondered, okay, is that is that the collateral damage? Is that the extent of this? But but crypto is such an integrated industry, and and despite its decentralized and open, transparent nature, it is pretty obfuscated. It appears that Alameda was part of that, and the real cause of of the downfall was that Alameda was getting margin called which means that it had taken out leveraged positions and had to post more collateral when those positions um, became, became less valuable and they needed additional assets and collateral. 
FTX, despite user policies saying that they would explicitly not do this, gave customer deposits to Alameda. Sam beckman fried claims that he did not realize that was what was going on, but, but that does seem to be what happened. Another driving force to FTX's ruse that may have warded off closer scrutiny was Sam beckman frieds philanthropic ethos. beckman fried regularly spoke of effective altruism, an academic and social movement geared around maximizing the most good for the world. At a high level, you cannot understand the rise of Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX without taking into account his focus on philanthropy and his profession of effective altruism. I got into finance in the first place um, to try and maximize the amount that I can donate to, uh, to some of the most effective causes. And, um, you know, I'd certainly love to be spending more time thinking directly about what these projects can be working on. Um, but my main role right now is to do what I can to help support them um, financially or, or, or any other way that I can. Sam Bankman frieds giving and his talking about his giving was core to the image that he presented on Capitol Hill in the press with celebrities, with the broader public. Philanthropy made Sam Bankman fried unlike any other crypto entrepreneur we've seen before. This was not somebody who cared about decentralization or those core tenets of the crypto movement. This was somebody, a self-professed capitalist for the purpose of giving it all away. Effective altruism received a lot of money and a lot of press from FTX, while FTX gained the reputational advantage of being this group of philanthropists and givers, and that's what made them stand out in crypto. And I think it brought them a, a level of mainstream uh, acceptability and cachet that other crypto companies haven't seen to date. Sam bankman frieds donations to Democrats do leave them in a bit of an awkward position. He was one of the biggest givers during this last election cycle, and there have already been calls for candidates and politicians to give those funds back. That being said, Republicans also received a lot of money from FTX. Ryan Salam, one of FTX's executives, gave about 24 million to Republican candidates. I think the really interesting question is, for charities that did receive money from the FTX Foundation, will they get to keep that money or will they have to give it back through bankruptcy court? Restructuring experts I've spoken to said there is a chance that they're going to have to give that money back. So it really depends on whether it's determined that the philanthropy of FTX was part of the broader scheme to allegedly defraud customers of their funds. And if that's the case, then those secondary transactions, the, the money that went from the FTX Foundation to charities, that could be clawed back. FTX's ripple of destruction is still unfolding but the damage to the larger industry could be everlasting. I think the big worry for everyone, especially within the industry, is that regulators will take away wrong lessons um, from the situation, that they will come in and start regulating even more when there is not enough clarity. It's important to understand that it's precisely lack of clarity and uncertainty that drove a lot of companies, including FTX, offshore, where they could set up shop in jurisdictions where the rules weren't as strict or where they could buddy up with regulators better. One of the real messages that's going out day and night from crypto entrepreneurs and, and executives that, that, that remain is that people really need to think carefully about where they hold their tokens and how they secure their assets. Because uh, if there's one thing to, to know, it's that if you see a balance on an app or a computer screen, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's there. And that you really need to make sure that wherever you store your tokens, if you store them with someone else, that uh, they have good risk management processes in place, they have been audited, and that they don't necessarily engage in potentially risky behaviors like, like, like lending and, and trading, or at least don't do so without proper consent from the customer. Another thing to be said here is that FTX didn't really have a real board of directors. There is a meme uh, where everyone stands in circle pointing at each other, you did due diligence and you did due, due diligence. So who actually had a look into what was happening early on.